Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Nordic webinar on oxygen and oxygen toxicity. First, I'd like to thank Kiesi for organizing this uh, webinar. My name is Mats Blenov, and I've been given the honor to chair this session. First, I would like to give just some rules of housekeeping for the questions afterwards. Following the lecture, there will be time for questions and answers and written questions. You can submit either in the chat if you are using a Google account, or if not, you can send them to the uh, web, mail address given in your, uh, on your screen. It is webinar at narva.se. So having said that, it's my privilege and honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor Ola Didik Saugstad. Uh, at the present stage of my career, uh, it is, uh, you start looking backwards, and uh, I have met some outstanding doctors and researchers during these 30 to 35 years that have influenced me and taught me a lot. To mention a few, people like Gregory with the CPAP, Bengt Robertson with the surfactant, Colin Morley, Peter Davis, Miller Stallman are the ones that come to my mind. But one that is very uh, dear to me and close to this is today's speaker, Ola Didik Salstad, who certainly belongs to this group of prominent clinicians and researchers that by questioning, study, and critically analyze the way we practice neonatology today have changed our behavior and made it so much better. Some words then on Ola Didik. He did his training in, at Oslo University in the medicine. Then he continued as a research fellow at Oslo University and also for a period of time in Uppsala in Sweden during the mid 1970s. Following his uh, graduation as a PhD, he did a postdoc at, in, uh, at the UC San Diego in the USA. Ola Didik has uh, had a lot of uh, position and currently he's a researcher at Oslo University where he previously been the professor of pediatrics and also the head of pediatric research. Ola Didik is presently also adjunct professor at the Children's Hospital in Chicago. Ola Didik is a member of a lot of different national and international societies as well as honorary member around the globe. Just to mention a few, he's honorary member of the German Society of Perinatal Medicine, the European Association of per Perinatal Medicine, the Norwegian and the Finnish Societies for Perinatal Medicine. Oops, we're in Sweden. It's not there, not yet, Ola Didik. It will come. And uh, maybe uh, most of all, he's an honorary member of the American Pediatric Society. The amazing work done by Ula Didik has not always been easy. Recently, he published this book. I hope you can see it uh, due to my background I'm using. It's his biography entitled Kampen om Oxygenet, The Battle for the Oxygen. And I uh, urge you to read it if you're interested in how a career in uh, medical research can look like and all what you have to fight. So then, without further ado, I would like to invite Uda Dvili and uh, to tell me and all the audience around the Nordic countries. And we very much look forward to hear your talk on oxygen and oxygen toxicity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mats, uh, for these uh, very kind words. Uh, uh, and I'm deeply moved by listening to you. Uh, it's an honor for me that you introduced me. And uh, uh, I also would like to thank uh, Kiesi for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about oxy oxygenation and oxygen toxicity in the newborn. Uh, do you see my slides and hear me clearly, Mats? Yeah, okay. Yes. So then um, I would like to, to welcome all uh, the whole audience uh, from all the Nordic countries. Uh, 
good dog, Paiva, uh, Paiva, all of you. And I know there are many old friends out there. And I hope that all of you are doing uh, fine during these uh, pandemic uh, times. So <clears throat> before I continue here on my disclosures, uh, I will not spend more time on that. As you all know, as neonatologists, oxygen therapy of the newborn is a kind of a, a voyage between Scylla and Charybdis. We believe that we have found the, the truth, the, the correct PO2 or saturation or whatever we how whatever mean we want to to measure oxygenation. Then we think that there's another better goal and so we continue. Uh, and it's not easy to navigate between Scylla and Charybdis, between hypoxia and hyperoxia. So what I would like to talk about during these 45 minutes is listed here. A few words about oxygen and oxygen toxicity. And then I want to tell you a little bit about the rationale for keeping FeO2 low during recitation, how it started when I was a research fellow, first in Uppsala and then in Oslo. And there are a lot of objections to the idea of using air for recitation. I, I mentioned a couple of them. And then uh, I will uh, come to the clinical interesting, I hope, uh, how much oxygen should we give for newborn recitation? And also, what is the optimal oxygen saturation targets the first minutes after birth? And then I mention some examples of oxygenation beyond the delivery room in the immature babies, in congenital diaphragmatic hernias and uh, primary pulmonary hypertension of the newborn before um, I try to conclude. So for those of you who are interested in topic, I just want to mention a few of the articles uh, we have published. Uh, this is from the last two years. Um, and you, of course, can find them on uh, PubMed. Uh, if I may draw your attention to seminars in fetal and neonatal medicine, the April issue this year, it is compl uh, completely devoted to oxygenation of the newborn. Very useful, I think, for all of us. Okay, <clears throat> so <clears throat> what are the goals of oxygen therapy in the newborn period? Well, we try to describe that in, in four points. First of all, of course, it is uh, <clears throat> the most essential is to provide sufficient oxygen, <clears throat> excuse me, to the tissues and avoid anaerobic uh, metabolism. And we also want to prevent hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and to promote brain and somatic growth. And for neonatologists to minimize adverse effects. Because although oxygen is critical to life, we also know that too much oxygen can cause a number of um, detrimental effects by increased oxidative stress, lung injury, diseases as bronchopulmonary dysplasia, retinopathy or prematurity, brain damage, impaired brain development, and also damage to other organs as the, the kidney and the heart. So just very brief, some of the basic uh, regarding uh, the role of oxygen <clears throat> and oxidative stress. So <clears throat> here's a picture of the inner mitochondrial membrane. And here we have the, the five complexes of the electron transport uh, chain, the oxidative phosphorylation. And here you see that electrons are transferred from one complex to the other and protons are pumped across the membrane and creating a gradient. And this gradient is used to produce ATP. Now at the end here of the electron transport, someone has to take care of the electrons and that is the role of oxygen. 
it uh, <clears throat> accepts oxygen and is reduced to water. So oxygen is the kind of the, the garbage cleaner in the metabolism. Now, some of these electrons, they <clears throat> leak out and generate uh, reactive oxygen species. <clears throat> and normally, these are neutralized uh, by antioxidants, antioxidant enzymes. But during hyperoxia, <clears throat> more free radicals are generated. And they may overwhelm these uh, defense systems. And what is also important is that for reasons we don't understand completely yet, less ATP is produced during hyperoxia. It's probably, we know that genes are, are down-regulated in all the five complex cells during hyperoxia. <clears throat> so, reactive oxygen species, they are detrimental to biological macromolecules as DNA, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. I just want to mention another aspect uh, of um, hyperoxia and oxidative stress I, I've been interested in. It's more now 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, uh, since I suggested that there is a free radical disease of the newborn. Oxidative stress, which uh, are caused by a number of, fact number of factors uh, contribute to oxidative stress, for instance, also inflammation. And these free radicals, they may attack a number of organs um, in the body and uh, may be cause or contribute to conditions as mentioned here at the bottom, interventricular hemorrhage, PVL, ROP, BPD, PDA, neck, etc. <clears throat> so how much uh, oxygen should we give during newborn recitation? And I will mention, talk both about term and preterm infants. Traditionally, neonatologists were using a lot of oxygen in the delivery room. And why, why did neonatologists do that? Well, there are several reasons, but I think one reason was that when the APGAR score was uh, introduced in 1953 by Virginia Apgar. Here is her uh, original paper. She used a lot of oxygen. 20% of her, her enrolled babies were given oxygen by one mean or the other. And we know that in order to achieve a high Apgar score of 9 or 10, the, the newborn has to be pink. And how can a new, newly born baby, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes of age, be pink? Well, it's only by giving oxygen. So many places in the world, every newborn baby was given a dash of oxygen in order to pink them up, to get them a high APCA score. People believe that high APCA score, nine or 10 is better than seven and eight. Wait, today we know that that is not the case. So what happens uh, during the transition from intrauterine to extrauterine life? Well, in fetal life, we know that the fetus is hypoxemic, it's cyanotic, there's some PO2 saturation values, and here is a delivery, and during the normal transition, pulmonary hypertension resolves, and there is a gradual improvement in oxygen saturation and the, the pulmonary arteries are opened up. So cyanosis is normal during fetal life and for the first few minutes after birth. So as I mentioned, APCA scores of nine or 10 at one minute at least, and probably not at five minutes is, is not possible uh, without giving oxygen. And this you can see here from, from this curve, where here we have the saturation on the y-axis and minutes up to 50 minutes at the x-axis. And you see here the pre-ductal saturations, two minutes is a mean of about, a little bit above 70, but you see there's a wide variation. And even up to five minutes here, um, we see that many of these babies do not have a saturation of 80%. So that's the normal development of 
of the saturation. I'll come back with some very new data on that uh, in a while. So what happens if you resuscitate a newborn with 100% oxygen? Well, I think the same happens, or we know the same happens, as shown by Richard Linner from Lund. Uh, in this study on newborn lambs, cardiac arrest was uh, induced by clamping the cord, and then the, the, the newborn lambs were randomized to be resuscitated with either air, you see the blue line here, or oxygen, the red line. And see that if you give 100% oxygen, you get a sky high PO2. By contrast, if you give air, you get this slow normalization into physiological ranges of PO2. So I tried to make a world map uh, describing uh, newborn recitation. Uh, and before 1998, all guidelines I know about, all the big international guidelines at least, they recommended to use 100% oxygen. Means that newborns who were resuscitated at that time, they got this high PO2 peak as described here. Mats uh, mentioned uh, that I did part of my research in Uppsala. In fact, I started in Uppsala with this uh, uh, man, Jesta Root, who was professor of perinatal medicine in, at the perinatal research unit at Akademiska Sjukhuset. And that's where I, I started my research. And, and uh, that was how I got the idea that perhaps one should be careful giving oxygen during recitation. So what I did, I, I measured hypersantin. Uh, that was part of my PhD. I developed a, a method uh, with the help of Jesta Root to measure hypersantin in, in plasma of newborn babies. Nobody had done that before. ATP is, a, hypersantin is a breakdown product of ATP. So our goal was, our aim was to make a biochemical APCA score. And yes, hypersantin increases during intrauterine hypoxia. Well, hypersantin is uh, metabolized by santin oxidase, uh, is oxidized to uric acid via santin. And um, in the 70s, end of the 70s, I measured hypersantin during recitation of an animal in terminal shock. And what you see here is that you get this enormous increase in hypersantin, exponential increase. Within a few minutes, it's way up, up, up to 100 micromolar per liter, very high concentrations. Now, at the same time, we learned that hypersantin, when it's oxidized to uric acid, some of the oxygen involved here is um, uh, transformed to the superoxide radical. So then I was starting to think that, okay, in a situation where you have a lot of hypersantin in the tissues and in the, in the body fluids, we have to be careful with oxygen because otherwise we'll generate more free radicals. So that was the theoretical background for the idea of, of avoiding 100% oxygen during newborn recitation. And this we published in 1980, 40 years ago. Now, a lot of objections to this um, idea. And people say that when there's lack of oxygen, we have, of course, we have to give oxygen, supplementary oxygen, and that's right. But maybe you have given too much. Maybe it is sufficient to give room air um, to supplement the oxygen, supplement the oxygen deficiency. And another objection I heard almost every time I gave a lecture in the 90s, we need to give oxygen to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. It's very dangerous not to give oxygen. But if we go to the literature, it's clear that Abraham Rudolph in San Francisco, who, who is the father of perinatal cardiology, uh, already in 1966, he showed that here is the pulmonary vascular resistance on the y-axis, and here is the PO2, millimeter mercury. And he showed in newborn calves, that when you reach a certain PO2 around 40, 
there's no further decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance. And if you increase PO2 even further, pulmonary vascular resistance starts to increase again. So this, this was shown actually many years before I started my research, uh, but people seem to have forgotten that. And we found exactly the same pattern for pulmonary arterial mean pressure. That means that it is sufficient to give air in order to open up uh, the pulmonary arteries after birth. And that has been shown now in several experimental studies. So we did um, two clinical studies in the, the 1990s where we randomized or, or pseudo-randomized uh, newborn babies in need of recitation to either air or 100% oxygen. And this is uh, a meta-analysis we carried out in 2008. There had been several years before that, but this was the most recent. We have here 10 studies where newborn babies had been randomized or pseudo-randomized to air or oxygen if they needed recitation. And if you look here at the bottom line here of this forest plot, you see that this is mortality. And mortality is decreased uh, approximately 30%. That was quite a dramatic uh, effect of just avoiding using 100% oxygen. So the world map uh, started to change like this. This is approximately 2009. Canada was the first country to change to switch from oxygen to air in 2006. A few months later in 2007, Australia came after and then Sweden, Finland, Russia, the Netherlands, UK and Spain were very early to switch to, to air from, from oxygen. You see Norway, a little bit more hesitant. We have to be careful also. Maybe we should start with 40%. Many other places also um, suggested that. So in this period, some of the babies did get, still got this PO2 peak, but many got this more physiological approach. In 2010, ILCOR uh, came out with uh, new recommendations and regarding oxygen, this is what they wrote in term infants receiving recitation at birth with positive pressure ventilation, it is best to begin with air rather than 100% oxygen. So ILCOR had been convinced by all the results that had been produced the last almost 20 years. So the world map changed more or less to completely blue like this. And we got this more physiological um, development in uh, PO2. So we try to illustrate what we think happens. So if you recitate with the air, you get this slower but more physiological increase in PO2. And you, you get some free radicals. By contrast, if you resuscitate with 100% oxygen, you get this enormous peak in PO2 like this, and this wave, I call it the tsunami of free radical production. And this is translated into the baby by cerebral vasoconstriction and brain inflammation. I don't have time to show you all these data, but you can find them. Pulmonary vascular reactivity increases, so it's the opposite of what people told me in the 90s that you have to give oxygen in order to induce pulmonary vasodilation. The opposite happens. And also myocardial damage and acute renal injury. And hyperoxia, the first 10 minutes of life, has also been associated with uh, childhood leukemia. Last year, a new meta-analysis came out from Wellsford and coworkers, American network, and basically it looked at the same studies as ours, but they had some fewer uh, enrolled babies. But fortunately for, for me, uh, for us, uh, they found more or less exactly the same as we found, uh, approximately 30% reduction in mortality if you start with air instead of 100% oxygen. And these authors, they stated that there will unlikely be any further studies on this topic. I'm not so sure about that because we know that uh, science uh, develops and there might be new truths and there might be subgroups of term, near-term babies who would need some oxygen. 
So this is just a summary of what I've said so far. Uh, in term and near term infants, we start recitation with 21% oxygen. But this is a, <coughs> a summary, very brief summary of how it started. Measured high percentin, found it was high during hypoxia. And if you gave 100% oxygen, you get a higher mortality than if you gave room air. And this is again, is uh, translated to perhaps as many as 200 lives that potentially can be saved by room air. In addition, I have to add that after uh, room air was introduced, uh, the Helping Babies Breed program was uh, rolled out. It's been shown that uh, uh, perhaps as many as 30% of so-called fresh stillbirths can be saved by bag and mask ventilation. There's more than 1 million of these every year in the world, so that means another 300,000 can be saved by bag and mask ventilation with air. And in the old days, many of these babies were not resuscitated at all. They just were described as, as death, dead when they was born. So this is the term babies. What about preterm infants? Well, we all know that there are a number of differences between term and preterm infants, and uh, I don't have time to go into that in detail. Uh, but in 2010, ILCOR also gave some recommendations for preterm babies. Uh, and this stated that because many preterm babies less than 32 weeks gestation will not reach target saturations in air, blended oxygen in air may be given judiciously and ideally guided by pulse oximetry. So what you can see here is that ILCOR did not say anything about which FiO2 to start with, and they didn't say anything about the targets uh, we were aiming at. And the reason for that was that we didn't know. 10 years ago, we didn't know. 2015, new recommendations came out, and here is for the preterm babies, uh, and ILCOR recommended against initiating res resuscitation of preterm newborns less than 35 weeks with high supplementary oxygen concentrations, 65 to 100%, and they recommended the initiate recitation with a low oxygen concentration, that is 21 to 30% oxygen. The European recommendations for RDS uh, that came out last year have similar recommendations. Oxygen should be controlled by using a blender, and the initial FO2 of 30% is appropriate for babies, less than 28 weeks, and 21 to 30% for those between 28 and 31 weeks. Adjustments should be guided by pulse oximetry. So let's look at the data. Uh, what is the rationale for these recommendations? Well, one of the <clears throat> first studies that came out was from Max Ventus group in Valencia, where they randomized babies less than 29 weeks to receive 90% or 30% oxygen. And what you see here is that there is no difference in saturation, strange enough. But I think the reason for that is that FO2 differences are, uh, disappears after four minutes. And the reason is that uh, one, are, one is uh, adjusting the FO2 according to the response. Heart rate was no difference between the groups. So these authors concluded that, uh, well, it's better to start with 30% than 90% because they also were able to show that there was increased oxidative stress for many days, several weeks in the high FiO2 group. Now, in order to really answer the question, which FiO2 should we start, should it turn high or low, the torpedo trial was uh, started from uh, Australia. In this uh, study, infants less than 32 weeks were randomized to air or 100% oxygen in the delivery room, provided the needed resuscitation. And we didn't find any difference in mortality uh, when you looked at the whole uh, group of babies. However, when we did a post hoc analysis of babies less than 28 weeks, to our concern, 
and surprise, we found that mortality was fourfold higher. Risk for mortality was fourfold increased if you started with air compared with 100% oxygen. So for that reason, we carried out a couple of reviews and meta-analysis in the, this field. So I will show you data from uh, one of the, the last ones where we compared outcome in preterm babies less than 32 weeks who had been resuscitated initially with high FO2, 60 to 100% versus low FO2, 21 to 30%. So here's the PRISMA flow diagram. We were able to find eight studies. We had more than 700 babies included. And what we found here is that there was no effect on mortality. Where do you start high or low? To our surprise, we found that in mask studies, blinded studies, mortality was lower if you started low. By contrast, in unmasked studies, it was the opposite. And we, we don't really understand this, but it might be that the, the mass studies are the newer ones when resuscitation was also carried out uh, with uh, pulse oximetry. So saturation was adjusted um, during the resuscitation. We didn't find any differences in secondary outcome measures as BPD, NEC, interventricular hemorrhage, <coughs> whether we start high or low. <clears throat> so this uh, leads us to the next question, development of, of saturation immediately after birth. And I just want to show you some very new data uh, from uh, Max Ventus group uh, in uh, Valencia. You, you, I'm sure that uh, most of you, maybe all of you know about the Dawson curves. Uh, Jennifer Dawson and co-workers from Australia published their curves on heart rate and oxygen saturation, uh, mostly in term babies, normal babies, that was 10 years ago. Now, uh, Max Ventus group, they repeated this, but now with delayed cord clamping. This is term babies. And here we have the <coughs> oxygen saturation, and here we have the minutes after birth, and we have the, the third percentile, 10th, uh, 25th, 50th, 75, 90th, and 97th percentile. Now, if we compare these new centiles with the Dawson centiles, you find here that with delayed cord clamping, the saturation is higher. You see here, compared with the Dawson curves. And after five minutes, you see that for both these nomograms, the 10th percentile has not reached 80% saturation yet. Here's a similar <clears throat> uh, uh, figure for the heart rate after de delayed cord clamping and compared with the Dawson curves, the, the blue line is the Dawson curve and you see that, uh, well, the first minute or so seemed that the heart rate is lower if you clamp the cord earlier than if you wait, but after that there's not a big difference between these two uh, um, data sets. Now, <clears throat> in the torpedo trial, these are term babies. So now we go back to preterm babies. So in the torpedo trial, we found that babies had reached a saturation of 80% within five minutes, had a 50% reduction in primary outcome, which was death or disability, highly significant. So for that reason, of course, we were also interested in what is the normal, if, if we can talk about the normal development of saturation in, in preterm babies? Well, based on the data we had, Max Vento and I, we, we published this curve um, 10 years ago. And you see at two minutes, uh, the mean, and here's two standard deviations, and here's the mean, around 50, and gradually increases slowly like this, but there's a wide variation. Now, it's not so easy to, to say what is the normal development of saturation because it depends on several factors. For instance, if you apply a CPAP, you get a higher 
uh, saturation that if you don't apply a CPAP. And there's also a gender difference. Of girls, they increase the saturation faster than boys, and probably because their lungs are more mature than boys. And then, as I mentioned already, but this was from uh, Ola Andersson's group uh, and a study in Nepal. And I think they were the first to show that if you to clamp the cord late, the red line here, saturation is higher. But these are for 33 weeks gestational age and up. We really don't know if the same is the case for the immature babies. So we had a cohort of more than 700 babies, uh, less than 32 weeks, who had been resuscitated with different FiO2s. Um, so we tried to, to follow these uh, babies and we plotted how the saturation develops the first 10 minutes. If you are resuscitated with air here, or if you are resuscitated with 30%, or 60 65%, or 90 to 100%. The shaded uh, curve here is the target given by the American Heart Association, and the shaded circles is the target given by the European Resuscitation Council. I have to say that these are not evidence-based. It's only the best guess. But what you see is that for all these groups, these are babies above 29 weeks. For all these groups, they were above the, or within the target um, immediately after birth, you see here. And it takes four or five minutes before the, the, the room air group reaches the target. If you look at babies less than 29 weeks, we see that all the groups, except for those who are given 90 to 100%, are within the target within a couple of minutes. For all the others, it takes seven, maybe eight minutes to reach the target. Now, we don't know if this is bad or not, but this is uh, at least how it is. We have looked at uh, the impact of the five minute saturation. And uh, what we found at the follow up of the torpedo trial was that cognitive score was significantly lower in those premature babies who did not reach a saturation of 80% within five minutes. You see, five points lower, which is uh, quite uh, significant. There was also higher mortality in these babies more interventricular hemorrhage, grade three or four, but there was no difference in BPD. So now the question is, I think we all agree that we should try to reach a saturation of 80% within five minutes. Should we start higher than we have recommended? For instance, we start with 100% oxygen and titrate FO2 down according to response, or should we start low and titrate up? Well. It's not easy to tighten it up. This is a study from um, Austria last year. It shows that the lower curve here are the babies who did not, the FO2 of babies who did not reach the saturation of AD, and the upper cur curve here, the diamond shaped uh, symbols, are babies who reached the saturation of 80%. And what you see here that is during the first three, four, five minutes, this almost no difference in FI2. It means that we cannot separate these babies. We cannot pick them out the first minutes of life and increase the FO2 uh, in order to reach a saturation of 80%. And the same is the case for the saturation, although it seems to be a little bit bigger difference, but here at three minutes, is not a big difference. It's very difficult in a clinical situation to say, this baby will not reach the saturation of 80%, we have to give more oxygen. So for that reason, some people have um, suggested we should start high. And there's another reason, and that has been shown in animal experiments that immature animals and probably immature infants, they need some oxygen to open the glottis. Uh, Decker and co-workers, they, they published a study uh, just some months ago where babies uh, 30 weeks or, or lower were randomized to be resuscitated with low 
FO2, 30% or high, 100%. So what they found was that the low group, the 30% group, they had a lower minute volume, longer duration of mass ventilation, lower oxygenation at five minutes, and prolonged duration of, um, oh, this is uh, hidden here, uh, uh, yeah, of hypoxemia, or at least it was shorter duration of hypoxemia in the high group and lower FO2 exposure during the first five minutes. There was no difference in duration of hyperoxemia and oxidative stress market. So these authors, they suggest that we should start high and tighten it down. We, we don't um, agree with them. We, we think it, there are so many detrimental issues here. Uh, toxic uh, effects of high oxygen that we have to be care careful. We know that preterm babies, they have a reduced protection of uh, oxidative stress. As I mentioned, we know that oxidative phosphorylation is reduced during hyperoxia. Inflammation is increased. And we also shown in, in animal studies that DNA protection and repair are down-regulated during hyperoxic resuscitation. And cell growth is also affected. So there are many reasons we have to be careful and not expose our tiny babies to hyperoxia. Supplemental oxygen, even very brief, leads to increased oxidative stress, inflammation, genomic changes, reduced DNA repair, and cell growth inhibition. And we also know that there are epigenetic changes during hyperoxia. We don't know how long they, they last, maybe there's for the rest of the life or it's just transition, tra transitory. But we have shown in, in, in mice models that you get epigenetic changes. Um, so most immature babies, they, they need oxygen. Uh, so how should you give it? Well, what we recommend and we recommended in a recent article in Journal of Pediatric is that it should be given as low and brief as possible and tightened up according to the response uh, measured by saturation and heart rate. And uh, now I'm finishing within a few minutes to so just say a few words about uh, oxygenation beyond the delivery room and I'll start with um, which saturation targets we should aim at for immature babies. And, then I'll refer to the NEOPROM study. Uh, the NEOPROM study consists of five studies, the SUPPORT trial from US, the COT trial from Canada, and the BOOST2 trials from UK, Australia, and New Zealand. And in this study, babies less than 28 weeks were randomized before 24 hours of age to a low saturation target of 85 to 90 percent or a high saturation target 91 to 95 percent. You see this is a big study, almost 5,000 uh, included uh, newborn babies. So the question was of course what is the optimal target so that which saturation for these immature newborns would result in the lowest death and neuro disability? Well, we know now that uh, in the low saturation group, there was more neck and was more significantly more higher mortality. On the other hand, in the high group, there was uh, significantly more ROP in need of treatment, but fortunately, it was not more blind blindness. So this uh, resulted in a change in recommendations. 2010, babies receiving oxygen, in babies receiving oxygen, saturation should be maintained between 85 to 93 percent. This was now changed to be between 90 to 95 or 90 to 94 um, in the American and the European uh, guidelines. Here I have um, summarized the meta-analysis, the three meta-analysis of the Neoprom studies. And what you see here, mortality is significantly increased approximately 18%. ROP is decreased in the low saturation group. BPD was now 
significant difference, but was more neck in the low saturation group. So here I have uh, looked at the risk difference between the high and the low saturation babies. And if you are above the zero line here, it means that it favors the high target. And these val numbers here are p-values. So here you see death, significantly more death in the low saturation group, significantly more neck in the low saturation group, but less ROP and less BPD. However, when we define that physiologically, we didn't find significant differences in the total population. But as you will see in the subgroups, in the support trial, they found that BPD was also reduced in the low saturation group. Now, so I think everybody, or most of the world's changed their saturation targets to let's say 91 to 95. And that happened also in Sweden. And uh, some years ago now, this study by Lundgren and coworkers from Western Sweden was published in ACTA, showing that after they changed the targets, there was an increase in ROP treatment, two to threefold increase. Uh, I haven't seen that uh, in other studies, uh, but of course, it, it is a risk to, to increase the saturation targets. What about long-term effects? Uh, well, recently this uh, study came out from US, from the support babies, but I looked at uh, blood pressure at school age in, in babies who had been enrolled into the Neoprom studies. And what they found was that in this case, there was less BPD uh, physiologically defined in the low saturation group uh, compared with, uh, so here's the, I don't get the pointer working now, but you see 86, 45 versus 86 BPD. So it is lower BPD uh, in the low saturation group, but there was no difference in blood pressure, systolic blood pressure was no difference. And I think that's good to know because these babies should be followed up for even longer time. So to summarize the, the Neoprom studies, Oxygen targets over 91 to 95 increase ROP in either therapy, but not severe vision injury. Oxygen targets 85 to 89 increase mortality and necrotizing enterocolitis. Long-term follow-up shows no differences between the arms regarding death, disability, blindness, hearing loss, blood pressure. And I, I haven't shown you the data, but we have shown, others also have shown now that hyperoxia leads to epigenetic changes in the lung. We don't know if they're transient or long lasting. And just two more minutes, a few words about congenital diaphragmatic hernia, uh, a few um, recommendations. First of all, as I'm sure all of you know, that we should avoid bag and mask ventilation. These babies intubate them early and uh, put in an orogastric tube. Um, and regarding oxygen is now recommended to start out with 50% oxygen in these babies. It's not big studies, but it's uh, what is recommended. The target saturation is a little bit wider than for, for the immature babies, 85 to 95%. And you should increase FI2 if there is persistent bradycardia or saturation less than 80% at five minutes. Delayed core clamping is also recommended in this uh, condition. And of course, avoid a high peak inspiratory pressure. And then finally, just a few words about primary pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. This is from Sata and Laxmin Rushima. And it's recommended that the saturation should be higher in these babies, 90 to 97%. And the PO2 between 7.3 to 10.7 kilopascals. So to end up and conclude, uh, I think we have the last uh, 20 years moved uh, and made progress. So we, we cannot individualize oxygen therapy to the newborn yet, but we are on our way to do that. So in the delivery room, in babies above 31 weeks, you start with air if they need bag and mask ventilation. Between 28 and 31 weeks, start with air or 30% oxygen. 
we don't know the optimal FO2 here. And for babies less than 28 weeks, start with 30% oxen. Again, we don't know the optimal. It might be 40%, might be higher. And this is important to find out in, in future studies. And we should adjust according to the saturation um, and the nomograms we have. I suggest to start low and tighten it up, and there might be different views on that. We need randomized studies to test out what, what is the significance of not reaching a saturation of 80% uh, within five minutes of age, and how should we adjust FR2 in the delivery room. And in the future, we, we should adjust or take into consideration uh, sex CPAP cord clamping. Beyond delivery room, less than 28 weeks, target saturation of 91 to 95 or 90 to 94. And we recommend very tight alarm limits. We know that the nurses hate it uh, because it's so difficult to do that. But we, the reason we have recommended that, for instance, in the European guidelines, is that we want to avoid hyperoxemia, the peaks. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia start with 50% oxygen and um, pulmonary, primary pulmonary hypertension uh, saturation of 90 97% and PO2s between 7.3 and 10.7. So with this, I will um, thank you for your attention and uh, I will give credit to my close collaborators, Sida Ramsey, Maximo Vento. I've been working with them for 25, 30 years now. Uh, Satya and Lakshman Rushima in UC Davis in California. He has written many of these uh, wonderful uh, cartoons I showed you. Julia Ovi, she was the, the brain behind the torpedo trial and many of the meta-analysis we have published uh, recently. And Vishal Kapadia from Dallas, Texas here has done some very interesting studies, uh, for instance, do, uh, um, regarding the heart rate and outcome, the first minutes of life. So thank you so much for uh, your attention and I will try to answer your questions. Thank you very, very much, Ola Didrik, for this beautiful presentation, comprehensive. You uh, answered the, the vast majority of my questions that I had. Uh, can I just remind the audience, I think you can hear the applause coming from Denmark, from uh, Finland, from Sweden and Norway to you. you. And, uh, we will take even better care of our babies following this uh, beautiful <coughs> lecture. Uh, while people uh, out in uh, the cyberspace uh, prepare their questions, I, I'd just want to ask you about, you know, my interest in low resource settings and you show these world maps of the spreading of the guidelines, but how well are they incorporated in practice in the low resource settings? Um, well, as you know, um, and uh, I know that you have been involved in helping babies breathe and uh, this intermediate uh, recitation algorithm we, uh, we made together with some other colleagues. Um, so I think that, for instance, in where you have been working in uh, Rwanda and Uganda, I think, uh, and I've been working in Mali in West Africa, um, we are completely dependent on, on using room air bag and mask ventilation. So I think um, at least where I've been working doing my, my studies uh, in Mali, uh, you cannot even talk about oxygen. Okay, uh, well, well I, I think it depends actually if there is access and in some of yeah. the projects I've been in, there is uh, compressed uh, oxygen yeah. and the, uh, the people not so uh, used to neonatal resuscitation and uh, uh, also with the late cord clamping before, wait until the uh, breathing starts before uh, cutting the cord is uh, physiological yeah. doing is so important. I really hope that they will incorporate this uh, recommendations. Yeah, the cord clamping, yes, I, I would be surprised if they don't do that. Mm. Uh, late, yeah, so they have already, at least as far as I remember, they have recommended delayed cord clamping at least for for uh, term babies. But uh, I don't remember exactly what they said if the baby needed recitation. Mm. 
Yes, uh, I mean, all the data coming from Melbourne uh, definitely says that we need to, David needs to open up the lung before the cord is clamped. So, yeah, yeah. So I thought. Okay, we still do not have any questions from the audience as I see it. Can uh, some, from, someone just confirm that? Because I don't have access to the YouTube. Okay, Ula Didrik, it has been a very pleasant afternoon listening to this beautiful talk from you. And I think I uh, convey the emotions from all the audience around. I can feel it all the way to Stockholm here. So thank you very much. And we're really looking forward to hearing more from you. Thank you very much, uh, Mats. Uh, and thank you for sharing this session. And I also will thank the KSA again for organizing this and uh, Say goodbye to everyone out there. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.